Hello, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Suzanne Wands, and I'm the executive director of the Harvard Law School Library. And on behalf of the library, I'd like to thank you all for coming and joining us uh, for today's book talk, which we're very excited about. It is Professor Larry Tribe's uh, latest book with Joshua Matz, Uncertain Justice, The Roberts Court, and the Constitution. And uh, copies are for sale by the coop in the back there, so you can pick up a copy and maybe get a signature if you're lucky. Um, and I'd like to thank the Dean's Office for today's delicious refreshments. Thank you very much. And um, I also wanted to let everybody know that today's session is being recorded. Uh, so if there's time for questions at the end, which we're all hoping there will be, uh, if you ask any questions, those will also be part of the recording. Um, and with that, I will just briefly introduce our panelists and we can get started. Obviously, we have our author, distinguished uh, university professor, Lawrence Tribe, who is also a professor of constitutional law here at Harvard Law School. And also, we have, we're very pleased to have with us today the Morgan and Helen Chu Dean of the Law School, Professor Martha Minow, and also Harvard Law School Professor Richard Lazarus, the Howard and Catherine Abel Professor of Law. Thank you all very much for being here. Can I just ask, are there any extra seats anywhere? Raise your hand if there's one near you. There's one right there's there one seems here. to be one there. So anyone who wants to sit down, there's some more seats. Okay. Okay. So should I just talk? Yeah. Please. Okay. <laughs> Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, no. Um, <laughs> uh, this is just about the last of the talks that I'm going to give about this book. I, I've done about 20 around the country. And it's just sort of my nature that I can't say the same thing twice, so I have to keep thinking of new things. I have to tell you, this is the only one I'm nervous about, because when you're at home with your own colleagues and your friends and your students, that, that's when you feel that you really shouldn't disappoint. Um, that said, I'm not going to say very much, because I'm very nervous. Uh, <laughs> I was especially nervous when Martha wasn't here because I, I, I had to miss yesterday's faculty meeting and I was sure she was just retaliating. Um, but no, she's here. She, she was teaching, which is amazing. Uh, she does everything. She deans, she teaches, she does all kinds of stuff. Anyway, let me say a couple things about the aim of this book. And I won't talk long because I mostly want to hear what they have to say. And I definitely want to have a, a, a substantial period for Q&A. Uh, its aim was basically to paint as vivid a picture as I could of nine very remarkable, very different people, uh, and of the Roberts Court's nine quite remarkable years since he became chief. And as it happened, just coincidentally, there are nine chapters. It's not one per justice, uh, but I decided to organize the book more or less topically around human narratives addressing familiar subjects like equality, guns, privacy, speech, presidential power, and access to justice, and a few sort of less <coughs> familiar topics like rights for sale, and what are the limits on the government's ability to tempt you to sell your rights in exchange for various benefits, even if it doesn't coerce you. Now, I tried at the same time, and this was with this wonderful research assistant I had named Joshua Matz, who is the co-author and with whom I worked seamlessly on the book, who's now clerking for Justice Kennedy. Uh, with him, I tried to get past the kind of cardboard cutouts and the two-dimensional caricatures, not only of the individual justices uh, who sort of fit into cartoon characters in the minds of the public, and to be frank, in the minds of many of, honestly, my own colleagues and many of the leading scholars around the country. They have these pictures of what it means to be an originalist or what it means to be a pragmatist. And those pictures are more misleading than they are informative. They're truthy, as Stephen Colbert uh, might put it. And in most of the public accounts, and to be truthy or truthful, some of the academic accounts, you get these caricatures and stereotypes, and I wanted to get past them. Not only about the justices and the court and what makes it tick, but also about the Constitution and how one might read it and the various methodologies before interpreting it. And I wanted to get past those caricatures 
partly by looking at unusual and unexpected alliances among the justices of the supposedly divergent camps and unusual and somewhat unexpected divisions within the ideological camps, uh, but also by focusing on linkages among disparate topics which are in different constitutional silos. Uh, I've taught for a very long time, longer than I sometimes want to remember, and in that teaching I've seen that you can't really understand the Fourth Amendment without understanding the first. You can't understand the 14th without understanding separation of powers as well as federalism. And throughout the book, scattered and not so daunting as to be off-putting to a, the general audience that I hope to reach, there are interconnections. I try to explain how the law of comprehensive governmental surveillance and the law of deep governmental probes into our backgrounds and our associations can't really be understood without talking both about unreasonable searches and seizures and about freedom of speech and freedom of association. And I also believe deeply, and the book is informed by this belief, that you can't really understand liberty without talking about equality. You can't understand liberty or equality without talking about human dignity. You can't understand the triple helix of liberty and equality and dignity without yet a fourth dimension of structure and federalism and the separation of powers. The most daunting challenge in doing the book, uh, and one that you will have to decide for yourselves whether we met well or not, was the challenge of not demonizing the decisions that are the easiest to take issue with. You know, decisions like Citizens United and stuff that it's very easy to say, oh my God, how could they have done that? And sometimes that's my instinctive reaction. But when I try to teach, since I don't want to preach, and when I write for a broad audience, since I want to be fair, I try to avoid demonization, and I try to get inside the heads of the nine very different people and what might have made them do what at first looks so bizarre. So I tried to avoid demonizing, and I tried at the same time uh, to expose the fault lines and the misunderstandings of what I think is reality that help explain what the justices were doing. And then when I do that, and I should say we, because it's not just I, I've worked very closely with Joshua Matz in all of this, but when we do that, we try at the same time to look at the fault lines and the problems in the reasoning of those who disagree with those opinions and come up with what I regard as beautiful, aspirational, but sometimes profoundly unrealistic solutions. I have in mind people who idealize and romanticize the idea of egalitarian, discursive democracy as a way of somehow overcoming the rigidity of First Amendment doctrine in cases like Citizens United. And I have in mind specifically not our dean, but Yale's dean, Robert Post, a brilliant guy whose work, I think, helps to illuminate the problems with what the court is doing, but casts a shadow over what he is doing. In any event, that's what the book tries to do. I hope some of you read it and enjoy it, but I'm more interested in hearing what uh, Martha and Richard, both of whom I thank profusely for making time in their amazingly crowded schedules uh, for being here, and all of you uh, for being here, and I welcome your questions, and I welcome their comments and questions at the same time. Thanks very, very much. It's not often that I read a, a law book that has the word environment only twice in 300 pages, <laughs> and I still like it, um, and doesn't even have uh, one reference in the entire 300 pages to my favorite Supreme Court case, Chevron. Uh, but, but this it is doesn't, a, I thought we had Chevron. I couldn't find Chevron. Oh um, but I love this book, and let me tell you why. Uh, and striking some of the same themes, I guess not surprising that Larry mentioned, although I didn't know that he was going to mention them. 
Um, it clearly has a point of view. It leaves no doubt that it believes restrictions uh, in judicial access under this court is inconsistent with what he perceives as a historic arc uh, toward increasing social justice. And the book is also more sympathetic to the views of some justices uh, over others, and it's not a book lacking in passion uh, or in vision. Yet at the same time, it rigorously treats each justice with enormous respect, embraces their integrity, their good faith, and their intellectual power. There are no cheap shots in this book. There's a lot of cheap shots done in academia. There's no Tweedledee, Tweedledum characterizations of the justices. It's a very fair-minded and exceedingly balanced presentation. The upshot is, I think, a sophisticated, penetrating description of the views of each justice. Uh, and there is an appropriate emphasis, as he said, on anomalies uh, as revealing. And the chemist in me from my undergraduate days likes that because that's how you always figure uh, compounds out. Uh, you look for the anomalies and how they express themselves. The unexpected vo votes he focuses on, how and why uh, Scalia and Alito depart in a lot of different contexts, how and why Kagan and Breyer voted in particular ways, like in the Sibelius 10th Amendment uh, issue, why the court goes one way on the fair Solomon Amendment case and yet another way uh, on the AIDS funding case. Uh, for me, an essential, essential takeaway from the book is, the, is that today with the court, we have very strong nine separate individuals. There are no shrinking violets in this group today. Uh, there are no weak links. Uh, they're actually all powerful intellects. That's not always been true on the nation's highest court. Uh, more often than not, there have been weak links up there. I don't think there are right now. It's akin to nine um, separate circles of thought um, and then sort of nine Venn diagrams and then the legal issues sort of cut across them in different ways. And more often than not, notwithstanding they're separate, they actually agree more often than they don't agree. Uh, the issues cut across and they have a lot of unanimity. Um, but more often than not, even when they're agreeing on the outcome, they're voting the same way on the judgment, uh, they're doing it in less than obvious predictable lineups um, than you would expect and a lot of people assume. Um, and even when the lineups are predictable, their reasons are different. Uh, and Larry does a particularly wonderful job of demonstrating that. Uh, the justices are not voting uh, based on sort of knee-jerk ideological reactions to cases. The book does, I think, a sophisticated and thoughtful job I've ever seen understanding what makes all nine of these justices truly tick. Uh, how, make, how makes them sort of see cases the way they do uh, and identifies patterns across the cases uh, that most people miss. It is actually the kind of thing that uh, advocates before the court try to do. Uh, and Larry is not surprisingly both a fabulous scholar but also a fabulous advocate. Um, and if you're trying to persuade the justices, you have to think of them as individuals to try to figure out how to frame a case to get those Venn diagrams to align in the right way. Uh, the sweep of the book is extraordinary. Uh, the topic selection is creative, insightful, and, and how he organizes uh, those nine chapters. It revealed to me patterns that I had not yet been sufficiently aware um, among uh, cases. Um, I thought his discussion of Citizens United, which you mentioned a moment ago, uh, was, was terrific. Um, he refused to turn Citizen United into the boogeyman of American politics. He criticizes those who treat it as a whipping boy for all the flaws of the contemporary American politics. That's the words of the, of the book. He acknowledges it's a hard case. It actually is a hard case. It wasn't an easy case. Uh, he acknowledged the system wasn't like great before Citizens United uh, and knowledge that wealthy will have always been finding ways uh, to find loopholes. And he focused on the fact the court did uphold disclosure requirements in cases since then. I thought his discussion of the First Amendment cases was an absolute tour de force uh, because the court's First Amendment jurisprudence is all over the place uh, because of these cross-cutting tendencies of the different justices. And it was the best explanation uh, I've seen from Citizen United to, you know, uh, bong hits uh, for Jesus to the crush video uh, cases to Garcetti, uh, the speech of public employees. Uh, I think the most powerful part of the book was uh, towards the end. 
on access to justice. Uh, just the way the cases uh, lined up, uh, a very powerful effect. Um, uh, the gun rights as well, discussion of Justice Lee and what he did there was also uh, terrific. Uh, there's only one thing I think I would have liked to have seen more of in the book, and I think we all tend to come through these things from our own perspectives, and I probably come at, from, from an advocate's uh, perspective, um, and that is a little more focus on the role the private bar uh, has played on the court. I think many underestimate the bar and overestimate the court. Um, the justices are terrific, uh, but they're far more dependent on the quality of advocacy than I think most people believe. The law clerks are great, but they're just that. They're law clerks and they're recent graduates. The justices are very talented, but they have limited time. I think good advocacy matters at the jurisdictional stage tremendously, which, just, which issues are taken, which cases are, are picked, and on the merits. Um, and I think that also explains some of what the court has been doing today, especially in the business cases. The tremendous influence that the private bar uh, has had on the court. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, in an argument I once saw, I thought very uh, appropriately looked down at an advocate who said, well, I assume the justices know whatever, and he looked down and he said, don't overestimate us. Um, and I think there was a lot of wisdom in that. Uh, it's, it's a great book. Um, it's a great book for scholars. It's a fabulous book for law students. Um, certainly a, a must book for advocates. But it's a great book because it's solely accessible uh, to anyone who's not a lawyer. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, just because I was so struck by it, uh, because it says so much about, about Larry Tribe, uh, and that is uh, his co-author. Uh, and that is you know, his willingness, uh, his emphasis, uh, his bringing in a law student uh, to work with him uh, this closely on a book, uh, and then to give him full co-author credit. Uh, that says a lot uh, about Larry Tribe. So I'm not taking a dissenting position. I think it's a fabulous book, and I think this event is very well timed before holidays so people can buy it as a present. <laughs> I'm going to say a few things about what uh, my knowledge of Larry Tribe outside the book uh, affords me as a purchase onto this book. So one uh, avenue of per perception that I have is I've had the great good fortune not just to be a colleague of Larry's, but actually at times to be involved in some litigation with Larry through the years. And I've always f f uh, viewed Larry's understanding of the Constitution uh, as just defying gravity. You know, being able, like a spider, to climb up the wall and you hit the ceiling and you keep climbing, <laughs> that's what Larry does. And always finding connections. And the spider image I continue because the, the web, the ability to connect the different parts, there's just a staggering uh, knowledge. I don't know anyone else who does it. And this book is a wonderful window onto that. Uh, you called it linkages, Larry. Um, you find a way that you pull on this and it pushes over here the, in a way that I've never seen anybody do uh, with such detail and such nuance. Second thing that I know about Larry um, that uh, is also true in the book is that Larry is a great listener. And this book not only analyzes Supreme Court opinions and takes seriously the fact that ours is a court that thinks it has to explain itself, but it also examines silences, what the court doesn't talk about, and then it connects it with what the justices actually say outside their formal role. So the, uh, I, I, the ability to connect with the speeches and the stray comments that judges make and to interweave it and pr provide a context that's what makes this book just, uh, you, you can't put it down. It's just, it's absolutely riveting and thoughtful and sensitive. It also gives a three-dimensional picture of the justices. Um, and I think it reflects, again, Larry's uh, abilities uh, as a listener. Um, I, I want to comment, uh, it's going to echo some of the things that Richard said so well, on what I think is, um, one more feature of what I know about Larry that's not in the book, and that is that Larry spent a lot of his professional life building a monumental treatise on constitutional law uh, and revising it, so a second edition. And then the time came for a third edition. And, it's, and as someone who's relied heavily on those editions, I waited with bated breath, but instead Larry wrote an essay about why he was not writing a third edition. 
And the explanation was compelling and powerful. And the explanation was, this is a time that doesn't lend itself to a treatise. This is a time that actually involves such constitutional change that the claim to provide a coherent statement of what's going on in each doctrine and how it all coheres would be false. And this book is the marvelous sequel to that essay that you wrote, Larry. Because without pretending to provide a treatise, it provides a window onto where we are that is so well captured by the title, Uncertain Justice. But at the same time, it doesn't leave us with a sense of it's completely a mess. Instead, you get a sense of sense of it. And it is a guide, but it's not a treatise. Um, and I will identify some elements that I think in, are new in the book in the sense that they put on the agenda of constitutional law topics that are maybe not absent but insufficiently attended to. But I'll close with a comment about what does it mean to not do a treatise. So new topics, access to justice, as Richard says, is an eloquent part of the book. This, of course, reflects another aspect of Larry Tribe's life. He left, uh, he took a leave of absence from uh, his professorship to become the first ever uh, office holder in the Department of Justice in charge of access to justice. And thank you for doing that, Larry, for serving the country, but boy, what a gift it is that we now have this chapter, which is a uh, powerful analysis of the constitutional dimensions of access to justice and the ways in which um, actual decisions are foreclosing <coughs> opportunities for people to use our justice system. Uh, and I think and I hope that constitutional lawyers and courses and many others will now take this subject very seriously as part of the core, part of the canon. Um, I, a second is guns. Now we all talk about guns. Uh, it's a big issue, but this chapter is a very unusual treatment of guns as an issue. It's not just the originalism debate. You offer, uh, a, I think, a deep analysis about how the treatment of guns is actually a window onto the society more generally. And that, too, I think, is a real contribution that others in the field ought to uh, pay great attention to. Um, so what does it mean to not do a treatise? This book is. Uh, so readable in part because it has a narrative uh, quality. They're stories. And it strikes me by the decision not to do a treatise, instead to do the, this. Uh, this book is able to have the architecture of the Constitution that is so powerfully and beautifully and elegantly elaborated in the treatise, but also to have the people and have the lives and have the people inside the building, as it were animating the building. Um, and I think that that's what makes it very powerful and very effective. The question that I have is how to relate the two. So Sartre wrote a book called Search for a Method in which he describes the challenge of the modern age is to take the insights of Marx and put them together with the insights of Freud. I'm putting it in my words and say, how can you take together the insights about structural analysis and put them together with the insights about personality and individual history? Um, this book does it chapter by chapter, but I'd be really interested, Larry, in your reflections on to what degree does an understanding of the architecture of the Constitution, including the linkages that you so powerfully demonstrate, set constraints on what the personalities can do? And to what degree do the personalities change the architecture? The book, chapter by chapter, explores that. But I'd be interested in your reflections, because that's what I think the project is. And that's why it's better than the treatise. That's saying a lot, because I love the treatise. <laughs> um, I want to just close, actually, by making a comment about the very last chapter, the very last paragraph of the last chapter, um, in which Larry talks about the way in which um, doing a constitution is not doing constitutional analysis is not to come up with formulas, um, but instead conversations, conversations. And I think that that is uh, the right word. You say it's not a blueprint, it's not a roadmap, not a polemic, but, and you, you say that it offers insight. I think it offers conversations. And I think at its very best, what our Constitution represents is a long-running national conversation. It's a conversation about how to live and how to structure our, our government and ourselves. 
Um, and this book is a tremendous contribution to that. It is Larry Tribe's humility that leads him to have the title be Uncertain Justice because it's an invitation for all of us to join that conversation. Wow. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not often totally speechless, and I'm not totally speechless now, but I'm as, <laughs> I'm as close to it as I, can, as I can get. This was really moving. I mean, I hope somebody's recording what yes. Richard and Martha said. Um, because I'd love my grandchildren to hear it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's wow. Um, first of all, I have to thank both of them for the generosity and the brilliance of what they said. They undoubtedly exaggerated the qualities that I bring to the subject, but I don't mind. It's, 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 very, it's very pleasant to hear. Um, as to Martha's challenge, I, mean, I suppose if I were to, you know, the next book I write, I would love to connect personality with structure, uh, hu sort of human character with ideas. That's, that's probably the most powerful and inspiring challenge anyone has put to me. Uh, you know, my publisher, our publisher on this book said, I want you to write another book and I, I want it to be really sexy. I want it to be you know, about uh, sex, violence, and the court, or I, I want it to be a, a biography that, that digs into the dirt. Well, I, that, no thank you. <laughs> um, but this is a challenge that is really worthy of anybody, worthy of all of us to think about. I mean, what is, we all know that, that law is not exactly mathematics. I mean, it has a wonderful logical spirit, it has a structure, it has analytic integrity, it has rigor, but it's about the humanity and about human character and the human soul. Um, but not much has been said that, that talks about how to link those, those parts of our subject. Um, and I have no illusions that I can say anything t terribly profound about it, but if there's anything that's worth spending time on, it would be that. Uh, but I want to end there because I am serious that I would love to have some dialogue with you guys. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Great. Maybe Martha is our dean. And by the way, now you know why she is dean. I mean, this is, uh, she, can, she can take stuff that isn't all that wonderful and make it seem like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, See what but, I mean about humility? See what uh, I mean? But I would like Martha to, you know, to, to direct call on this. people I will. and, and be, happy be the to do moderator that. here. So who would like to make a comment? Please say who you are. And is there a microphone uh, going around somewhere? No microphone? No, sorry. Okay, then, then well, I, I please. I'm Ken, Ken Bressler. I took two-year courses with Professor Tribe. I graduated 30 years ago. I've read all your books. You're still my teacher. <laughs> I'll give you the check after the... <laughs> Not really. I mean, I know that one of my colleagues, Mark Tushnet, who once wrote a, a rather nasty review of my treatise called Diatribe, <laughs> <laughs> that he isn't, it's, it's not the greatest of his works. He, he's a brilliant <laughs> scholar. Uh, but his thesis was you can't be a litigator before the court and an honest describer of what it does. You have to make compromises. And I thought a lot about that. I mean, he wrote that after I wrote the treatise, and I wondered, have I made compromises? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I call it the way I see it. Um, and I realized every time I wrote something critical about the justices that a client who asked me to represent that client in court would have to take account of the fact that perhaps they wouldn't be capable of discounting that critique. 
but it's not secret. I mean, it's all very much in the open. And I figure if a client is willing to take that risk, so be it. Um, I don't think I've made that compromise. And the reason there really isn't an intellectual tension is that when I take a case, and I only have done cases that I actually, I mean, it's, it's a lucky and very fortunate position to be able to only take cases where you believe in the position that you're arguing. It's not necessarily unethical for a lawyer to advance a position that she doesn't fully believe in. There's a role for the advocate. But as it happens, I've been able to say no to cases where I feel that tension. And so I argue what I think is right. And when I do, I'm trying to have a conversation with the justices. Martha, I think, rightly describes a very rich conception of the Constitution as a kind of intergenerational conversation that the nation has with itself, with earlier generations, and with generations yet to come. And rightly or wrongly, when I'm talking to the justices, I think of myself as engaged in a conversation with them. Uh, I try not to act as though I'm teaching them. They're teaching me at the same time. But it's a dialogue. And the nature of the dialogue is such that it doesn't feel so different to me from what it is when I write a book or an article. Um, every time I do a case in the court, I'm incredibly nervous beforehand. It's like a roller coaster. I keep thinking, oh, how could I have made that argument in the brief or whatever. When I finally stand up and say, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, the nervousness sort of goes away. I'm in the flow. It's a wonderful zone in which I feel now I can talk to them. I know they've got the votes. I don't. We're not equals. But I can talk to them honestly and say what I think. Um, and so I haven't felt that tension. Yes, please, and say who you are. Yes, uh, we need a microphone now. <laughs> so my name is Patricia Alfonso. I was a student here at the law school as a young lab student in uh, 1990, 1991. And I had the great uh, fortune of uh, being admitted to Professor Tribes. Uh, uh, constitutional law class, and I would uh, second what was said by the speaker just before me. It was really a fantastic uh, opportunity, and I still remember it very fondly. I'm also fortunate that I've now returned to the, to Harvard, and I am a fellow at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. And I have a question for Professor Drive, which I don't. I'm not sure it is covered by your book, which I have only bought yesterday evening. <laughs> so I haven't had the opportunity to read it. But I would like to ask you if you think that the status of international law within the, uh, within the US legal system has somehow uh, weakened uh, compared to 24 years ago uh, when, when, well, when I was here. I have the impression that there were with uh, Medellin in Texas and QML, there have been a number of um, uh, setbacks. But I wonder if you can, without taking too much of uh, right. uh, time, give me uh, well your take on that on that topic. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great it's a great question. Thank you for it. I, I I'd say there are at least three dimensions to an answer. Certainly, the view of the current Supreme Court is far less respectful of our global obligations and far less prepared to learn from international and foreign experience than was true a quarter of a century ago or even half a century ago. Uh, the kind of overwhelming agreement, at least within some ideological groups, that it's almost a sin, uh, if not a violation of constitutional principle, uh, to cite a foreign Supreme Court decision or learn from foreign experience strikes me as xenophobic and blind in the extreme uh, and, and, and quite bizarre. And it's strange for us to expect other countries to learn from what we're doing if we're incapable of learning from what they're doing. So at that level, there's a, a blindness that I'm confident in a kind of eternal optimism is only temporary and that we'll get over it. The world, is, the world is one and we will eventually learn that our experiences are exceptional only in some dimensions 
and that we can learn a great deal. Sort of a second dimension is the focus of American practitioners and American lawyers and American law schools. I mean, those are vastly more globally oriented, informed by foreign experience, illuminated by comparative study. Uh, people now routinely in many law schools have courses in comparative constitutional law. People learn from the South African Constitution uh, and from the Australian Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Courts of, of Canada and other countries and from international tribunals, a lot of things that are informative and, and exciting. Um, a third dimension, I suppose, is the fact that we are teaching people who are going into a global community. There's no way that we can do that without being open to international experience and learning from students from abroad. I've learned a great deal from students like you a quarter of a century ago. Um, I recognized your face, didn't remember your name. Uh, I've learned a lot from my LLM students. We have a wonderful LLM program. The educational system is now much more integrated into the world, uh, and it seems to me that that's a positive and exciting, uh, exciting development. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll join the list of adoring former students <laughs> <laughs> without embarrassing you any more than that, but ask you something that I hope will be a harder question. Um, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You, in many senses, started your career at a moment of um, enthusiasm and hope about the relative transformational role of the Supreme Court in American society, in American constitutional culture, um, the central role of Brown translating into civil rights, uh, um, the set of the Warren Court decisions that really were transforming. Um, I wonder to what extent, and in this regard, I'd be really curious, uh, uh, Richard and Martha, to hear from your different perspectives as well for a conversation, um, how this court-centric view of social change, of constitutional change, uh, has withstood the test of time and contestation and a more balanced um, uh, court. Mm -hmm. um, if you think of the Civil Rights Revolution, we have the arguments about how much of it was really court-centered and how much of it was legislative, and those are real and alive. But you look at today, you look at the gay rights revolution, it's not clear that the court led as opposed to essentially followed a massive cultural transformation. If you look at the questions of uh, constitutional powers over war making, over torture, over conduct in war. These seem to be operating in domains that are hidden, administrative, not really exposed in a way that a court really simply follows. Um, if you look at the four decades of uh, increasing inequality and declining quality of life of 50% or more, these really follow the removal from the domain of the Constitution of these very basic questions of economic equality and structure. How should this generation think of its role in terms of understanding where you push and what you mm -hmm. do in, you know, you look at the President Review <coughs> Group report on surveillance. So much of it was about move this person from this office to OMB because that will actually have a hand on the spigot. And I don't think that it was silly. I think it was really sort of well-intentioned, deeply understanding people who know the system from the inside, tweak it here, that will make things flow differently rather than make those arguments. Mm -hmm. What's this generation to think about this focus? Well, again, a, a wonderful question, Yohai. Um, when I was in law school, I was, I was here in the 60s. Griswold v. Connecticut had just been decided. It was just nine years after Brown v. Board of Education. Some people, I think, were convinced that social progress was to be judicially driven. Um, uh, I thought there would be some hope of that, but I didn't ever think of Brown v. Board as coming down from Mount Olympus with 
the former governor of California, Earl Warren, doing it. I remembered even at the time of Brown that he was very much involved in Korematsu. Uh, I didn't think that courts were the salvation. I thought that they were part of, shall we say, a conversation, a dialogue that had legislative and representative components, that had grassroots components. Um, I, I hadn't thought in terms of the categories of popular constitutionalism that have become so much more part of the conversation these days, but I recognized that there was a deep and powerful political and social movement of which Brown became a temporary, symbolically important capstone, but when Gerald Rosberg and others wrote books showing that Brown had not lived up to its most exact, sort of extravagant promises that we were perhaps a more demographically segregated society now than we were at the time of Brown. That was disappointing and sad, but not shocking to me because I recognized that there is an ebb and flow. And I never thought of myself as teaching my students that social change had to come principally through the courts. I think it's, it, it, it would be wrong to assume that there is sort of one captain of that, uh, of that complicated multi, sort of multi-dimensional ship that sails on the oceans of, of, of progress and occasionally hits the shoals of, of failure. I mean, take, for example, the gay rights movement. It's true in a way uh, that the courts are not at the vanguard. They're, they're just catching up socially and culturally, but they haven't been silent. When Margaret Marshall wrote the Goodrich case, and when a lot of people said there'll be terrible backlash, people will recognize that we shouldn't go in the direction of marriage equality and LGBT equality. They were wrong. I mean, it's clear that people saw that the sky didn't fall when there were same-sex married couples. Goodridge made a huge difference. Without it, it's not clear that the entire avalanche would have occurred as dramatically as it has. And then on the other hand, I mean, then you've got Windsor. Windsor was a halfway step. It then led to this remarkable array of almost unanimous decisions moving beyond federalism and to pure liberty, equality, and dignity, which is where the court may well end up when five to four it reverses Jeff Sutton's quite brilliant opinion in the Sixth Circuit, either this year or next. It's a dialogue, and I think when you ask what should this generation do, I mean, I think our job is to equip people to understand that there is no one answer, no one path to justice or progress. There are a lot of tools. That's why we teach about legislation as well as adjudication, more so than we, than we used to. There are social movements, the kinds of movements that Lonnie Guineer and, and, uh, and Charles Ogletree and others teach about. It, it's a complex mix. And so I don't myself think, well, we are now in a completely new regime, a new era, a new time. We have to throw away our emphasis on appellate opinions. They are an important part of the story, and they're an important part of the story that, that uh, is sort of never-ending. Uh, Professor Benkler has asked us to speak, although I have not much more than a footnote to say to what Larry just said in that wonderful answer. I will say this, um, you know, Yochai, your, your questions focused on the gay rights movement and uh, also the role of the executive in the war on terror and also economic inequality. I, I guess I think each of those have um, interesting uh, variations. Larry spoke, I think, wonderfully about the role of the state courts uh, in the uh, same-sex marriage uh, 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 movement. And here, I think, the dialogue uh, between the state and the federal government, between the legislatures and the courts, just shows a constitutional system at work. It's actually about as good as you can get uh, as a constitutional system at work with setbacks and with progress. Um, executive detention raises the challenges that you describe of technical expertise, secrecy. Um, but even there, I look at the Supreme Court as playing an absolutely pivotal role in Hamdi and Hamdan uh, and uh, really setting limits, um, not altering everything, but setting limits. 
Um, but it would be wrong to imagine that the courts would be expert enough or appropriately positioned to make recommendations of the sort that the NSA kind of panel did. I think it's a complicated um, bureaucracy that we have now, and figuring out a way that constitutionalism can operate when you have ever more complicated bureaucracies, I think is a challenge that I certainly didn't think about that much in law school, and I don't think it was on the agenda that much in the 1960s. That's a new, new level of concern. I think that the one issue that you raise where I guess I have some real questions is about economic inequality and disparities. There once upon a time seemed to be the possibility of using uh, constitutional law to address those questions. Uh, that has been foreclosed. And things have gotten much worse. The disparities are much worse. And here, although I very much appreciate Larry's treatment of um, Citizens United, the uh, permeation of those economic inequalities into our political system make me very, very despairing mm -hmm. of how to find the levers to address those issues right now. I want to, I'll make this quick because we have very little time. I want to get another question. But basically, everything Larry said, um, I would have put uh, in the context of environmental law, uh, the, the area that I have followed uh, for the past several decades. I think when I was in law school here, and I will be a little competitive and say I had Larry Tribe as my common law professor even before anyone else uh, here did, <laughs> it was 37 years ago. Um, um, I think we all had a very judicial court-centric view uh, of how we were going to achieve sort of uh, better environmental laws. It was going to be through lawsuits. It was no coincidence that uh, you had uh, the environmental law movement modeled after the civil rights movement. It was the Natural Resource Defense Council. It was the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. Uh, they were all modeled after the NAACP and what uh, Thurgood Marshall had done. They were following the same what, template. What about NEPA? Right. Uh, and, and stuff like that. What were we emphasizing? Well, the, yeah, but, that, but NEPA was the reason NEPA became a significant law of the National Environmental Policy Act is that it, the framers of it in Congress had no intent. They had no even thought it would be judicially enforceable. Mm -hmm. uh, but then this uh, young new judge in the D.C. Circuit named Skelly Wright, uh, who was on the D.C. Circuit only because he was so unpopular in, in the South because of his civil rights uh, decisions in implementing Brown Board education that the Southern Senators got President John F. Kennedy to get him out of the, uh, uh, Louisiana and put him on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, and he actually saw environmental law like civil rights law. Uh, he saw future generations uh, to be akin uh, to minorities uh, who were unrepresented in the political processes in the market. So he's the one who created NEPA more than anybody else. Uh, you know, it's an unbelievable first uh, sentence in that great opinion in 1971, just a few weeks after Calvert Cliffs, where he says, you know, therein lies the judicial role. Our responsibility is to make sure that these important principles are not lost or misdirected in the vast hallways of the federal bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a different time. Uh, and I think a lot of us learned uh, since then uh, that that can just be one approach, uh, and you can't rely on the courts. Uh, and some assumption the courts will always be forward-looking, always being progressive, and always be pushing um, is misguided. You need a more di diversified portfolio if you're going to achieve uh, social change and, and uh, that arc uh, towards social justice. A and there's no shame in using the democratic process uh, to achieve that end. Footnote to that, I mean, it does seem to me that because there are other countries with more recent judicially enforceable constitutions, like South Africa, that embrace affirmative rights, rights to a decent environment and housing and so on, they explore different models of the conversation between courts and legislatures in which courts enforce provisions whose structure is that the political branches must make reasonable efforts to achieve various things and then rather than pretending that courts can themselves decide what rights to a healthy environment people have or what rights trees and plants and the ecosystem has, they are more overtly nudging the legislative branches. Now, there was a time in American law, uh, a little bit after the early Warren years, 
when courts were beginning to develop theories of that kind, it came to a dramatic end with Richard Nixon and with some of his appointees uh, to the court. But what that tells us is that elections, too, have consequences. Yeah. And that not only the political process, but the grassroots process of public participation is an indispensable means of moving the society in the direction of, of that great arc that Martin Luther King envisioned. Yes. Hi, my name is Sam Shepard, and unfortunately for me, I'm not one of your past law school students, but I'm or, or of the you. other Sam Shepard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm an aspiring law school student, so. Great. Good. Um, I wanted to ask you whether or not you see uh, any, any parallels between the past pushes for uh, economic substantive due process rights uh, during the Rock era to kind of the modern pushes in First Amendment jurisprudence um, for free speech and freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to ask if you think, like, what consequences do you see this kind of momentum having for future Supreme Court cases? Well, I guess, a wonderful question, um, Sam. I mean, there are two different things, one of which is encouraging to me and one discouraging. The one that's discouraging is the way in which some of the assumptions of the Lochner era, that, that the distribution of wealth was sort of given by nature and not to be manipulated, have found their way into First Amendment jurisprudence. In cases like Sorrell in the commercial speech area, dealing with drug prices, and to some extent in cases like Citizens United and, and McCutcheon v. FEC. That's not so encouraging. Justice Breyer has been particularly eloquent in his dissent saying this is just Lochner redux. But the part that is encouraging is that the Lochner era wasn't all bad. I mean, economic rights are real. They included the rights to hire a teacher to teach your kid a foreign language or uh, rights to make decisions about your life. There were cases like Meyer and Pierce in the 1920s. They became sort of the seeds for Griswold and Rowe and for Lawrence v. Texas and for Windsor and for, uh, and for what Windsor's successor might be. That is, substantive due process is not dead. It's good that it's not dead, I think, uh, because the Constitution is not just a series of narrowly defined specific rights in the Bill of Rights much more, as John Harlan understood in Poe v. Ullman, it's a continuum, and there's a geometry that connects those rights, and I think that's, that's a healthy recognition, and I'm glad that it, that it didn't die. I think that that will be the end of this conversation for now, but it's a bigger conversation that must and will continue. Please join me in thanking uh, the library for sponsoring this, yes. Suzanne. And and, the, and please join me and Richard in saluting Larry Tribe for this magnificent book. Thank you.